Thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony Frischconnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony Frischconnect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Plant Problems. This is your host, Tony Frischconnect. Hope everybody's doing great today. I appreciate everybody listening in. And this is a part two of a two-part series with Zoe Lee and your host, Tony Frischneck. This next part, I am actually handing the mic over to Zoe. And if you guys weren't listening in, she was our last week interviewee. Zoe is a Taiwanese attorney who's focusing on the cannabis industry. She's a criminal attorney. So I had a chance to catch up with her and check out that interview with her. You should see it's under Zoe Lee. I'm going to share with you my story over this next interview as she asked me some questions, uh, if you haven't heard it before. So I hope you guys enjoy it. So I look forward to sharing with you. Up next, my interview with Zoe Lee. Okay, Tony, could you tell your story about, like, seeing, I know you been joining this industry like way earlier so could you tell us your story like how you started sure so back in 2005 i've got a construction background so i grew up in the construction industry my father was a carpenter my entire life and in the early 2000s our industry our housing and construction industry was really booming so this was in northern colorado and at the time when that happened, everything was great. So people were doing remodels on homes and they were, they were what we call fix and flips. They'd fix them up and sell them. So I was looking for a business that I could take to my own. I had some friends that were in real estate. And I had a roommate of mine that was very successful. And I started talking to him about real estate and where do I start? Where do I do this? He just said, you got to start. I had no money. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew some guys that could help me in finding a place, potentially helping me figure out the remodel side. I had a lot of the ideas on my own, but I didn't know how to start. So I talked to some family. I actually talked to my grandmother. I said, Grandma, I was so nervous I was because I was going to ask her for some money. And getting on the phone with your family, especially when you're young, I was in my, let's see, I was early 20s. I think I was 22. And I had a number of asking her for $15,000. At the time, when you have no money, $15,000 is like a million dollars, right? And so I remember calling my grandmother up and saying, Grandma, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And would you consider lending me money? And she goes, well, how much you need? And I said, well, I'm looking for $15,000. And she kind of paused for a second. And in my mind, I'm like, she's going to tell me no. She, of course, she's not going to lend it to me. So she says, oh, yeah, I could probably do that. And in my mind, my, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is actually happening. Okay, you know, and my voice is kind of like cracking a little. That's awesome. Thanks, Grandma. And she's like, yeah, let me get back to you in a couple of days, and then we can get it sent to you. And she mailed me a check for $15,000, and I was like, okay. So I was able to purchase a house with my friend, and we were business partners. I did all the work, and he just helped me get the house. And by that time, we're looking at probably 2004. So right around 2004, I had started doing a remodel in a place. It took me a year. I did it all on my own. I slept in the place, worked a second job at Home Depot and Sears and just to pay my bills. Fortunately, I didn't have to pay rent because I was living in the construction. So I paid my bills and we got it all ready to go and sell it. And the market had just dropped. So we were able to sell it. I didn't make any money on it. I believe just broke even. And I started another project next door. In about a six-month period, this wasn't going to pan out again. It just felt like the same thing. So I had had a friend of mine that I had been talking to. He owned a hydroponic store. And that's where you get all the equipment and all the grow supplies. And I had been doing some dinners with him. And he's like, man, you should really look at investing. And in, in the meantime, so I borrowed that money from my grandmother. 
I didn't know how I was going to pay her back because I wasn't there. So she ended up passing away in between that couple year time period. So I didn't have debt that I had to pay right away, which allowed me to invest in the grow that I had been discussing with my friends. So long story short, I started growing in a house with about a thousand square foot basement. And my friend had supplied me the plants for the property. So I could start growing. I had a bunch of little clones, little guys. They were probably three or four inches tall when I got them. This was in 2006. So I was doing the remodeling on the house and I was starting the grow operation at Mm -hmm. the same time. And so I had rented a place, finishing up the remodel on the property and growing in a basement. And so as I was growing in this basement, I'm trying to finish up this project that wasn't going to make me any money anyway. And I was doing something highly illegal. And I got through two harvests. It took me, the first harvest took me about six months. And I was able to pay off my expenses on that first round. And then the second and third round, I was able to kind of catch up. Well, in the meantime, I was able to finish that property to put it for sale, but I still didn't make any money. So at that time, it was like I had to make something work or else I was really going to be in the hole and I didn't know how I was going to get there. I was really stressed out. I was making money, but I was really stressed out because of the anxiety of growing illegally. I looked at trying to find a better way to do this. And so I really started looking into medical. So as I started researching medical, I was able to figure out how to work through that process. It took me about a year to figure that out, getting your medical marijuana card and going through that and then also finding patients to grow for because that's how it was legal in Colorado. You could grow it, but you had to grow it for people, only so many plants per person. And then I really started getting a full-fledged business going. After about a year and a half, I had started a new grow facility down near Denver in a basement again. I was doing a basement. That's like legal. Well, yeah, as legal as it could be because I was following all the guidelines, Mm -hmm. but there wasn't a lot of regulations at that time. So I shut down my operation in Fort Collins, moved just outside of Denver, and I started a new operation there, and I was doing deliveries to my patients. I had 40 patients, and I was doing deliveries up and down the front range, and things were going really well. I was doing incredible. And I had gotten another house nearby, the first property, where I was doing my flowering, and that's the maturing the plant to create flowers, right? So in one house, I was doing a veg house, so I was vegging the plants and growing them up to the size I needed. And then I'd move them over to the maturing house and I would flower them at that house for two months. So I was doing that constantly back and forth. Every uh, two and a half months, I would be able to flip those houses over and have a harvest. So at the end of 2009, everything was going great. I had my patients going. I was covered, everything. I was starting to make money. And I was leaving my house one morning in Denver. So I had moved down to Denver. But I was growing in these two houses and I was just working constantly. I was driving hundreds of miles a month. (laughs) I had one assistant that was helping me with some of the growing, but I was doing it all on my own. And so I did that for up until the end of 2009. So in October of 2009, I walked outside my door and got a greeting from the DEA. And so they said, we are raiding your house right now. And we know you're growing marijuana there. And I just flipped out. It was the fear and going through my body at that time was just insane. So I was up high, then I went down low. And now I'm getting everything taken away that I've just worked my tail off for the last four years. So not only that, I had Mm -hmm. challenges on the growing the whole Mm -hmm. time. You're having issues, you're farming. So at that point... I had equipment. They actually only raided one of my homes. So I had an equipment at the other house where I was doing the flowering. And I took that equipment and I went with what little money I had left. I had about 15000 and I borrowed some money from friends and family. I went and rented a 6,000 square foot warehouse. There was no choice. I couldn't fail. That was like uh, before the recreational. That was period. before recreational. But I thought you were like, you have license to grow like medical marijuana, no? I did for the patients. The problem is that local government, mm-hmm. they didn't really know. There was, since there was really very little regulations, I didn't, when the DEA came, they just threatened me and they never prosecuted me with anything. They never charged me with anything. 
well, that's really scary. Like, is a lot of people are facing. So I was about to ask, what kind of like other harassment from police or government before like is fully legalization you've been facing? So before legalization, that was the big one that I had to deal with. But there were also several other people that I knew that were growers. They were dealing with similar situations. They were being pestered by the DEA and they were trying, they were using the old drug tactics of, of, of the drug wars that have been happening for decades. Yeah, that's pretty scary. So basically you've been harassed by like a police and DEA before like it's fully legalized. Even you have medical like license to grow cannabis, you're still having this kind of like problems, right? Yeah, so once we got the warehouse mm. and we found a landlord that would rent to us, we had some scares there, but most of it was just dealing with the city and getting them to understand. And then they started developing regulations while we were in that warehouse. So we were fortunate enough that we were early enough, kind of like where you guys are. We were able to start our business in somewhat of the gray area, which allowed us to start quicker because businesses right now it's a huge undertaking financially to go in and start one of these grows. When we started ours with $30,000, they have to go in with millions. I see. So after that, you just like keep growing and wait till you legalize. Like, I mean, recreational legalize, you're already like way ahead with other competitors. Is that correct? Yeah. So there were quite a few people growing, but it was still small. When we decided we're going into the warehouse, then this is real. When I say we, I acquired a couple business partners throughout that time period because we had vertical integration, which is you got to grow and then you got to sell most of it on your own. So it's like opening two companies. So we had a partnership. They actually ran the retail side of the facility and we ran, me and another business partner grew the product and then we managed the warehouse. Okay. So compared to like the current situation and back then, like early stages, you just start that warehouse. The size of growing, I mean, the farm is different, right? Like now it's way bigger. Yeah, so it would be considered an extremely small grow at this point. But it, back then it was bigger than most people could imagine because it was legal, right? So you had never seen legal grows happening like this. Now we're looking at Colorado. There's tons of outdoor grow. I think there's a outdoor grow in Pueblo that's 36 acres and it's all outdoor, huge plants they're doing. But there are still some smaller grows, but the majority of them, I would say mid-range, the smaller guys are probably growing in 15 to 20,000 square feet of grow space. But back then you were like a thousand in your biggest, sort of? Yeah, I was a thousand in my biggest. And then I went from a thousand to 5,000 square feet. So that was a huge leap. Wow. Like that was like way bigger. That's like, this is amazing. I mean, and so the technique we need to use is way different, right? Back then you could like water it by yourself but right now you need like bigger scale ups equipment yeah so there's a lot of automation that's mm -hmm. involved now there's also in colorado because it's the most mature market i'm sure people out there will probably disagree with me people from california and oregon but it's definitely commercial scale now we're seeing mainstream big companies that, or they're creating their little companies are consolidating into larger companies and they've got 40,000 square foot of indoor and then they've got a couple acres of greenhouse as well. So it's much larger than it used to be. Wow, the progress is really impressive. Okay, I'm going to switch the topic. As a pioneer of the industry, what's your opinion on the naming system? I will have strawberry banana, we have like OJ Kush, we have different names, but are they like a real thing or they just like make it for like marketing? What's your opinion? That's one of the things that hasn't been accurately transitioned. It's not accurate, I'll say that. These are names that were passed down from generational growers and a lot of them have been crossed with other strains mm -hmm. and created new strains. And so nobody really knows. These are names that people came up with. They made them up. And really what it needs to come down to, and I imagine it's going to happen with medically really soon, is they're going to take it and they're going to break down the CBDs and THC, and they're going to name them just like, you know, they're going to come up with normal things like ibuprofen. You know, they're going to have these things that come out of it that make sense, because right now they don't. If I may ask, when is your first time 
how many years you've been using marijuana. The reason why I'm asking this is like, I want to know what's, did you see like as any difference between nowadays marijuana and the early days, five years ago, maybe? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's funny, I haven't had anybody ask me that one yet. But I actually didn't start smoking until my late 20s. I was 27. So it was right before I started growing. And I understood, well, this isn't that bad. But there are, I mean, you hear from the old days, because I wouldn't consider, I mean, it's only been 14 years since I was, since I last smoked. But you hear about people saying, well, the older generation says it's much stronger. It really doesn't take that much anymore. There are some really high THC strains, and they're not for everyone. I have a smoker, and so I don't need a lot to actually feel the euphoria of the of THC mm-hmm. itself. But some people smoke a lot and there is some tolerance that's built up in people's system and they need a little bit higher THC level. But that's all up to your personal feeling and what works for you. So I think trying to share that with people and saying, just because one person like it doesn't mean it's perfect for you. So basically, you don't feel like there's like much difference between old days like cannabis and nowadays like those like different strains. I think there is, and only because we're getting more of a variety than we ever used to. Back in the underground days, you might have only had one or two strains to pick from. Now you have like 50. And the other thing is, is people are allowed to really focus on multiple harvests consistently years over years. And so they're getting better growing that plant. So of course, they're producing a better product, which is probably has higher THC, higher CBD in it. And if you want to get down to it, the terpenes and everything else is much, it's, yeah, it's absolutely evolved. The plants mm-hmm. definitely evolved. And I don't know if it's us that are evolving or the plant is, because the plant's been around for thousands of years. Yeah. So that sounds, seems like now that after like legalization, we just like create a lot of like a new strain, but we don't really know what. Is that new or just made up now, right? But do you think one day this chaos, like chaotic, will like get cleaned up? Yeah, they're going to come to a point, and I'm guessing it'll come after full legalization in the U.S. There's going to be some companies that said they're going to be like, we're a brand and we're going to build some stuff that we know what's in it. And we'll call it, especially if it's medically, they'll find medical names to call this product that the plant produces. I think that's probably what will end up happening. But it's going to take some guys that are working in this industry for the long-term goals. They'll be like, yeah, this whole name thing doesn't make sense. We want to make sure that our customer gets the same thing every time. And it's going to take doing that testing and creating those specific guidelines like this is what falls into this category. I think that's what it's going to take. One final last question. From before, like people who grow cannabis is more like individual grow or like smaller farm. But nowadays, it's getting become like a big enterprises, like a madman. Like madman or like Planet 13, those like a big dispensary, they probably have a farm enterprises. So I don't know if it's like a conflict of ideas of like a marijuana belongs to everyone, and everyone could grow it and become like more getting to like big enterprises, evil, you know, like I'm a little bit like laugh when, so when I see this capitalism getting involved in this like a hippie, laugh wind, free style like plan, I feel a little bit weird, but I want to know about your opinion on that, like from smaller, now maybe in the future when like a big company like patent certain strands and like Monsanto, like, you know, like agriculture system that make small farmers really difficult to survive. What's your opinion on that? Well, I think it's going to depend on what market you're in. I mean, some markets are going to allow for the home growers still to happen. And I know Colorado's that way, I believe, right now. And you can have six mature plants and six immature plants, which are, they're not, that means not flowering plants. And each state is different. That's what's really crazy about the U.S. We're trying to legalize a plant. And it's basically like 50 different countries are deciding how they want to legalize it. So there's a lot of confusion that's happening. And so some states are going to allow it or some countries are going to say what's fine to grow. And so those states will have some leeway and somewhat keeping the corporations or the big industry out. And some are going to say, no, we want them to control it right now. 
And you're also going to find that in different countries outside of the U.S. You're going to find some of that because there will be countries that are going to allow one or two licenses for these big corporations because they think that they can control it better. It's a matter of if you want to keep it in the hands of the people, you should always allow them to be able to have some part into growing their own medicine if they want, right? So I'm not really one way or the other. I think they both have a place. As long as if you want it in your local area, you should pay attention to your regulations and get involved. I think that's what one of the biggest things I learned throughout this whole process is really understanding regulations and being able to make them work for the community instead of work for the government. And that takes you and me and everybody else out there getting involved and saying, I want to say in this. And so I feel like sometimes our society doesn't really get that anymore. They've lost a lot of that and they they just let lawmakers pass stuff really simple. And now, especially with something as big as cannabis legalization, everybody should be involved. Whether they're for it or against it, they should be involved. It's a part of America and it's a part of our society. So take advantage of what you have. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you for your time and thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you, Zoe. I hope we brought something a little bit different for you guys today. I know this has been unique for me. So if you would like some more information about either my book, blackmarketbook.com, or like to review some stuff on plantproblems.com, I have all my episodes listed at plantproblem.com. So please visit it and also leave your comments and reviews. I'd like to bring some great stuff to you guys. So If you guys leave me some comments on what you want to listen to or who you might want me to talk to, please leave that and I will do my best to handle that for you. So thanks again for listening, guys. I really appreciate my listeners out there. And if you have any questions, of course, visit plantproblem.com. Bye for now. You've just listened to another insightful episode of Plant Problems. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues. For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblems.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frischconnect. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey.